is not unlike a, uh, a horror movie. I don't like those kind of movies much. I have friends who do. They tell me there's an art to it. I don't know. Uh, I, I do enjoy a little thrill now and then. I don't mind some action and adventure, but this is pretty dark. And you imagine it. I don't know, you go to bed, normal night. You wake up, you're not in your bed. You're in a valley. Craggy rocks line each side, and it's a bit shadowy and dark, perhaps a, a cloudy and tumultuous sky above. As you walk through the valley, you hear a, a cracking, a, a crunching underneath your feet, and you think, what is that? And you try to see, and lightning flashes, and it lights up the whole valley, and the valley is made of bones. Bones upon bones upon bones, dry bones. A true valley of the shadow of death as it were. It is a thing right out of horror film, and yet there it is, Ezekiel, seeing it in a word from the Lord upon him. The poor guy. Ezekiel was a prophet in the latter eras of the people of Israel. That means after the Babylonian exile, after the nation of Israel was destroyed by enemies from Babylon and all of their goods and all of their people taken captivity to Babylon where they were kept in a ghetto, where enemies of theirs sought to have them destroyed entirely, where they were without their God because for them God dwells in the temple and the temple alone. One day, by the Chebar Canal, Ezekiel, a faithful priest, away from everything, is standing and he sees suddenly these wheels upon wheels and a grand throne and archangel seraphim with eyes on every place coming toward him. And from that moment on, for the next few months, he never knew when he was going to be in reality, as you and I see it, and in a vision from the Lord. His visions run a rather large gambit across their, their path. Everything from the conviction that indeed God had left the temple and was with them where they were. But also that back in the temple, the most dark arts and cultic events were taking place at the hands of the Israelites who remained there, buried beneath the surface. And then as well that they would eventually be returned to that land. Many, many prophecies. In the midst of these... We have this very famous prophecy of the dry bones, which is no doubt placed here for us this morning because of its reference to the Spirit of God coming upon those bones. And on this day of Pentecost, that is exactly what we are remembering, that nearly 2,000 years ago, in Jerusalem, a city that you can still go visit today, after the man Jesus of Nazareth had been killed at the hands of all mankind and risen from the dead and appeared to many witnesses, though not all would believe it, after these things and his ascension into heaven, he fulfilled his promise, a promise older than his flesh, but not as old as him, a promise that Joel the prophet spoke of as well, that God would send a special dispensation of the Holy Spirit at the end of time in order to awaken the minds of all mankind to true prophecy. And as the eleven apostles are not babbling random tongues, but proclaiming the mighty works of the Lord, that's proclaiming the death and resurrection of Jesus in every language out under heaven, the people there hearken to this, and they wonder, what is this thing? How do they know these things? And Peter says, this is what Joel prophesied. Here it is right now. The sun will turn to darkness. Do you remember a few weeks ago on that Friday morning when it did? The end of the world has come. But it has come in the man Jesus Christ. It has come in his flesh and his blood, crucified and raised for you. And now this that you see, us preaching this fearlessly to you, with magician-like magician powers, the ability that will spill out from them going forward, the ability to speak in foreign languages and to raise the dead and to heal the sick, that even their shadows and their clothing, the apostles, begin to heal people. That this is the Spirit's work to get you Jewish people to believe your Messiah has come, your covenant is over, and the New Testament begins. And indeed, it is this Spirit pouring out that is the reason we collect and keep and hold the writing of the apostles and put them with the prophets as the Spirit's very word to us today.
With all that being said, though, I would like to take you, Christian, back past that day of Pentecost into that valley of dry bones to see how this is nothing different, nothing new. It is the same faith, both Old and New Testament, the same truth which Christianity has always preached from Adam to Noah to Abraham to today. It is the same reality, only of old it was veiled in shadow and mystery, and now, because of Jesus, you have the fullness made clear to you. So we'll be able to see that looking back now. What's going on with these dry bones? Really, there are three things going on. One, this is a symbol. This is a symbol of the fact that Israel will be restored to the land, that they're going to be taken out of exile in Babylon and put back into the place where God will save the world so that Jesus can come and do that there. Two, this is a picture of the resurrection of your spirit, which is truly given to all who believe, Old and New Testament, in the Christ. Those who look to the Messiah who would come, those who look back to the Messiah who came and is coming again, The Spirit alone awakens us to trust in Him over and against the world and the devil and our flesh. That's two. And then three, that great and marvelous day we yet wait for, when every dead body will indeed have flesh put back on it. And you, you will rise from the dead forever. Let's think about those things as we look at the text then. Again, I said a little bit of verse 1 before, the hand of the Lord was upon me. It was not fun to be a prophet. Don't wish for such things. It wasn't like every day you just got a little feeling from the Lord. It was random. It was out of the blue. You're having coffee with a friend, and then bam, you got a vision. Not the best way to make friends, let me tell you. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. Again, think of Psalm 23, Yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That is not a green valley with buttercups and daffodils. It is a place right out of terror and horror and awful things. It was full of bones, full of death. Verse 2, And he led me around among them, and there were very many on the surface of the valley, and they were very dry. So at least it wasn't zombies, right? Is just dry bones, but the idea here is that it has been dead for a very long time. So first and foremost, the people of Israel who God has cast out of the land, they deserved it for a long time. He waited and waited and waited before he did that, but eventually his hand was forced by their impenitence and unbelief. So also, however, it has been even from the day that Adam and Eve ate of that fruit that our bones have been dry as humanity. Every baby born to our flesh, to our species, is dead already. Dead in the spirit. They kick and they scream, sure, you got to feed them or their body will follow their spirit. But they are dry bones in the sight of God until they are spoken for by his word and redeemed. We inherit from Adam death. And it's been on for so long that indeed we are very dry. Verse 3 He asks a question. God asks a question, a teaching moment, you might say. Son of man, can these bones live? Now just think about that for a moment. The next time you're at a funeral and you see a body, it's not even dry bones. The flesh is still there. Can that body live again? Now imagine a pile of bones here brought in. Our ancestors, we upend the graves and bring them in and lay them down and ask, can these bones live? And Ezekiel responds with a very common prophetic way of answering a question without answering it at all, more or less saying, well, you're God, you tell me. Surely you know, he says. And then God says to him, speak truth. So a lot of people want to think the word prophesy means tell the future. That's not entirely true. To prophesy is to hear what God says and say it again. And if God is saying something about the future, then indeed you're telling the future. But if God is saying something about the past, then indeed you're telling the past. And if God is, in fact, saying something's going to be right now, then you're saying what's going to be right now. Prophesy to these bones. Repeat my words to these bones. You're going to see it happen, in fact. He's going to say, say this, and he's going to say it. Prophesy to the bones. Say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. How great, indeed, is the mystery of our faith. Dead as we are, that word of the Lord comes to us, and we hear it. 
We awaken and we believe this is what Pentecost was all about. That's what this moment is all about. Hear the word of the Lord. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. What is God going to say to the bones, though? It's important to know specifically what's being said. Thus says the Lord God, right? A word of the Lord. I lost my place. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. That's my answer. Can these bones live? Yes, I'll do it. Now, very key here. It's sad, we can't do this in English, but both Greek and Hebrew have the same reality. The English just lost it somehow. The same word for breath is the word for spirit and is the word for wind. In Greek, it is pneuma. In Hebrew, it is ruach. In Hebrew, they always have the ach on the back of everything. Ruach, spirit, breath, wind. So every time you see any of those words in the text, it's all of them, right? We translate one because we got to kind of pick. It's all of them. Prophesy over these bones and say to them, I will cause spirit to enter you. I will cause wind to enter you. I will cause breath to enter you. When the great rushing wind comes on the day of Pentecost, it is a great rushing spirit and a great rushing breath. They are one and the same. So it is very much here a prophecy that the Spirit of God is going to enter these dead bones. And what's the result of the Spirit of God? The same thing that happened to Adam in the garden. Do you remember this? God gets down, I guess, on his hands and knees. I don't know. He forms him out of mud. He forms his body, but he doesn't live. He's just a body. And what does he do? He breathes his Spirit into him. And that mud man becomes Adam the man of earth, the human. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come over you and cover you with skin and put my spirit in you and you shall live. With a result. With a result. This life you are given again shall make you to know that I am God. I tell you, I can't hear anything from Ezekiel, I am the Lord, without thinking of Samuel L. Jackson. I won't explain the reference, but no one says, I am the Lord, like Samuel Jackson does. i got to say, you will know that I am the Lord. Faith. Faith is what is created by the Spirit. What happens? He prophesies. He hears. God says, say this. I say this. That's what prophecy is. I prophesy as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And what's the sound? The bones shaking, rattling, rumbling. Imagine it all. What a, what a host of sound that would be. A rattling as bone came together, bone to bone, flesh to flesh. What an image as well. We're back in the horror film. I can kind of invert it at the end of... Raiders of the Lost Ark, you have a really bad claymation flesh coming off of a body. Don't watch it just for that. It's not a bad movie. But it's the other way around. Now the flesh is coming up onto the body. Every single body. It's kind of not the thing we'd put into a Sunday school pamphlet, right? And yet it is the hope of Christianity. It is the hope of our life. That in the twinkling of an eye, with an archangel shout and a trumpet blast, your body as it is right now, even not dead, will be clothed with immortality. A body just, un, uh, just like unto our Lord Jesus Christ's imperishable reality. Ezekiel's seeing it ahead of time, as best as he can. Sinews and flesh come upon them, sin covering, but no breath yet. And now we're back in the garden with the living body and yet no life. So he says to prophesy again, prophesy to the breath. O Holy Spirit, come, which is what we'll be praying in just a moment as well. O Holy Spirit, come. Prophesy to the breath and say, come from the four winds, O Spirit, O wind, O breath. And breathe spirit breath upon these slain that they may live. Now, the bit about the four winds there might be a little confusing. Hebrews were not nearly so addicted to science as we are, and so they talked about things with symbolic terms. And so just as there are four directions you can go on any map, north, south, east, and west, they spoke of the four corners of the earth, and the four corners of the earth were also referred to as the four winds. 
It's all a means from the ends of the earth, from everywhere that can possibly be, from beyond what we even see. The Spirit comes and spirits these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded, verse 10, and the breath came into them and they lived and they stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Again, a wonderful image. Not one we see too often in any of our Christian imagery, but the church militant, the church at war, not with swords and shields and armor, but with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and the armor of light, which is the faith and gifts of God, the breastplate of righteousness, which is Christ's own imputation of eternal life upon you, the helmet of salvation, which is the promises of God, that you shall not die, that you shall live, the shield of faith, that knowing these things, you can stand against all, all of us together, not one warrior, but an army exceedingly and great. And so Israel of old was going to go back to that promised land so that Jesus could come. And the Israel of new, you and I, we know that Jesus has come and we look for his coming again. And yet that is not how we see ourselves, is it? We are a lot like Israel of old. After this resurrection promise is pictured for us in verse 11, we hear about the weak, shaky-kneed faith of humanity. Then he said to me, verse 11, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. They had the prophecy of Jeremiah. He said to them before they were taken into exile, you're going to be taken into exile so that you will repent and believe and I will bring you back. And yet they think we are cut off. Just as you, my friends, here at St. Paul, you see the numbers, the finances, the changing culture, the struggle, the buildings, the school, and you say, what shall we do? Where is our hope? Are we not cut off? And I tell you, no. No. Though the steeple fall down, Though education disappear from our shores and we return to a dark age where we're living in caves and hunting with sticks, the creed which you confess, the God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the death and resurrection of Jesus will not depart from you as an individual nor as a people. Though they herd us into jails, though they chase us with fire and pitchforks, nothing can take from you the armor which will make you to rise from the dead on the last day. And I tell you, if you know that, then the rest of it, it doesn't matter. And I'll tell you this too, you're not as small as you think you are. If you trust this faith, if you believe these words as a people, and you let it help you walk through whatever else may be, you're not done in Rockford. You're not you got more capacity than we can even dream of once we stop chasing rabbits and stand convicted upon the Spirit who is within us by these words. Prophesy to them and say, I will open your graves. I will raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I cannot promise you that St. Paul Lutheran Church will stand here until Jesus comes back, here or northwest, whatever, stand in Rockford somewhere. I cannot promise you that. But I can promise you that as long as two or three gather to hear these words preached, and then to enter into them by means of bread and wine, which is Jesus himself, Israel, promised land, eternal life, is already here. And nothing shall stop our Lord from manifesting who he is beyond the two or three who gather. When these words go into you, they don't just stay there. They don't just rattle around and fall out the other ear. They go deep down into the heart and they grab onto the gut and they become all that you know. So that you are unafraid to say them out loud. To give an answer for the hope that is within you. Which is not that we've got a pretty building. And is not that we've got a nice school. The hope that is within you is that Jesus is risen from the dead. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. You know 
that he is the Lord. Your grave shall open. The Spirit is upon you. The land is already here for faith. And we're walking toward a land that will come soon enough by sight. In the name of Jesus, amen.